Amen. I remember when I first heard that song, I, when they first played it at church, I started having like a borderline panic attack. I said, wait a second, where did that come from? But it is a Christian song. Right. Toby Mac. Yeah. It definitely had me. I was like, where how'd that slip in there? <laughs> Amen. So we are we are going to talk about a subject today, and, and I get it. I understand that there's going to be a lot of disagreements. Um, probably get some couple of Facebook messages, uh, maybe a couple of emails. But you can't always give the dessert. You've got to give some vegetables too, right? Everybody wants the dessert, but every now and then you got to cut. You got to cut some of them onions up with some of that nasty old spinach. Give them what's good for them. And I, I <laughs> so listen, y'all, work with me on this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, hey, turn me down a little bit too, Uriah. Thank you, our Pastor Jeremy. God, I just, I pray, this is my prayer, Father, in faith, agreement with the church. I do not preach, preach my opinion. I don't preach the text out of context, which makes it a pretext, none of that. I preach the word. I give the word. Nothing else, God. God, and help our people get a different perspective on it. Lead me by your spirit, God. No condemnation. Just conviction. In Jesus' name. Uh, my one of our pastors came up with the the name intoxication. I, it was already out there, so I went with it. I but <laughs> let's put the scripture up there, Uriah. Let's First Corinthians chapter eight, verses four through thirteen, and we're going to be preaching from the NLT. So what about eating meat that has been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really a god and that there's only one god. There may be so-called gods both in heaven and on earth, and some people actually worship many gods and many lords. But for us, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. And there was one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through whom we live. However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as the worship of real gods and their weak consciences, conscience are violated. It's true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we don't eat it and we don't gain anything if we do. But you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you with your superior knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience by eating food that has been offered to an idol? So because of your superior knowledge, a weak believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed. So man, I've been on this, should Christians drink alcohol? Is drinking alcohol a sin? Man, I want to tell you it is so bad. I do. I want to light it up and say, alcohol will drive you right to hell. But if I do that, then I would take things out of context and I would not preach sound doctrine. And I've went through, when you study the Word of God, they teach you this in school. It's, it's called exegete the text. It's called exegesis. So when you read the Bible... In the American version, you have to go back to the original language because when they translated the Word of God from the original language, they used an American word that best fit what the original language spoke about. So in the New Testament, it was Greek. So when you study the New Testament and you, and, and you, mention, and you see the words like wine, you have to go back into the Greek and, and, and see what that word was in the Greek. In the Old Testament, it's in Hebrew. So you have to go back into the Hebrew to get the proper understanding of how they're translating the Word of God into an English language to the best of their ability. 
So we went to where Jesus turned water into wine. And I've heard, man, listen, this, this topic has been fought in schools for, man, this is, I, nobody agrees on this. Nobody. I mean, they, they'll fight you to death. You've got the liberals that say you can drink. You've got the conservatives saying you're going to bust hell out wide. It's just a crazy mess. And, and no one can come into unity. But I found something that we all better believe in or else we are living in sin. Connected to alcohol. Now, I can give you a hundred scriptures in the Bible that says don't drink. I'll give you one that says about being drunk. About being drunk. I'll just work it here for a minute. Proverbs 23. 29 through. Who has anguish? Who has sorrow? Who's always fighting? Who's always complaining? Who has unnecessary bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? It is the one who spends long hours in the taverns trying out new drinks. Don't gaze at the wine, seeing how red it is, how it sparkles in the cup. I've been there, man, on a hot roof. Like, man, that, that corona is sparkling. Because I used to drink like a fish. Who has bloodshot eyes? It's the one who spends long hours in the taverns trying out new drinks. Don't gaze at the wine, seeing how red it is, how it sparkles in the cup, how smoothly it goes down. For in the end, it bites like a poisonous snake. It stings like a viper. You will see hallucinations and you will say crazy things. You will stagger like a sailor tossed at sea, clinging to a swaying mast. And you will say, they hit me, but I didn't feel it. That's the word of God. This thing was written thousands of years ago. At least they had the problem then like we got now. I didn't even know it when they beat me up. When will I wake up so I can look for another drink? That talks about getting drunk as the sin. And I I, so I I went through the whole, man, I have spent hours on this thing, man, trying to, went through the Greek and Hebrew. So when Jesus turned water into wine, I've heard people tell me, well, it was grape juice. Okay, well, we went through that. And and it actually, it wasn't grape juice. It was grape juice, but it was actually, grape juice translated into Greek is oinos, which means unfermented wine. And in Jesus' culture, the women and the kids were not allowed to drink fermented wine. They could not drink alcoholic wine. The women and the kids could only drink the oinos wine, the grape juice. So I went to wine in that. Everybody hits me. Well, would Jesus turn water into wine? Well, it must have been grape juice. It must have been diluted. They didn't have a lot of water. But the original context of that scripture says it was fermented wine. It was alcoholic wine. And I wish I could say it wasn't. But if I say it wasn't, then I would, I would give you false doctrine. And one of the things as preachers, you have to be careful never to preach your opinion. Never to sway away from the word. If I preach my opinion, what I think the word of God says, and I can, I can make the scripture say anything I want it to say. But I got something for you, though. That's going to make you think twice about taking another drink. So the fact of the matter is, it's not the wine that's the sin. It's the buzz. And and the fact of the matter is, wine in the ancient days did not have the alcohol. See, remember the Bible says drink wine. It doesn't say Corona, Budweiser, Bacardi. No, it doesn't say. He says... Jesus turned it into wine. He didn't turn it into Jack Daniels. They didn't have that back then. He didn't turn it into a nice Coors Light or one of, we used to call them the silver bullets, the big six by nines that had the most alcohol levels in it. You know, one of the, he, he didn't turn it into that. It was fermented wine. The alcohol level was a lot different. And it's true, the longer you let the wine sit, the stronger it gets. That's a fact. So when I hear Christians, you know, they're tipping them back. They're like, man, Jesus turned water into wine. I'm like, oh, but you're drinking Budweiser. 
with a little umbrella hanging out. Ooh. Jesus turned him, remember? Okay. So, if I tell you, if you sit at the dinner table and you drink a beer that you're sinning, then I, I would be wrong. I remember first missionaries came to my house. I was a weak, weaker Christian. I was just saved and I was zealous. Man, I'm like, no, anybody that drinks, anybody that doesn't fast three days a week is busting hell wide open. I'm telling you. And listen, these missionaries came to my house, freaked me right out. I flipped out. I had just started school. I'd been saved probably three years. And I was living in the parcels before I was married. And these missionaries from Portugal, Portugal had came and the, the AG says, they're going to stay at your house. You're going you're to spend some time with them. And okay. So they took me out to a restaurant. I'm like, so we're at the restaurant and, and the missionary orders a beer. I said, what? Oh. I just... I said, this can't be happening. So I just looked at the menu. I'm like, I And then the other missionary ordered a beer. And then they drank it. And I pushed my chair back off the table. I said, what are you doing? Like, I cannot believe you. I'm telling everybody you're not a Christian. <laughs> They said, what is it? I said, I, you ain't saved. You just stink and drink a beer, dude. And you're going to preach tomorrow morning? So I called him up. I said, hey, hey, you better get fired. These missionaries, man, what's going on? They took me to a restaurant. They're drinking beer. So they had to, they had to come in and calm me down. No, seriously, I was going to leave this school. I'm done. This ain't Christianity. I knew y'all were a bunch of wolves. Y'all were hirelings. I'm out of here. I'm out. They're like, calm down, dear. I ain't calming down nothing. You just set me up. I, I actually thought they were trying to set me up to see if I would take one. Because the paranoia, the conspiracy theory, you got to know where I came from. Everybody's out to get me, right? It's like, oh, yeah, I got y'all. You ain't. But when they started drinking it, I said, they just committed the crime, too. We got problems. So they, they, they enlightened me. They said, in the European culture... And I still don't process that well. Because, here's the piece, soon as you get the buzz, that's where the sin's at. So how long is it before you get the buzz? Come on, I know one beer, I'll give you one. I mean, unless you drink every day. I mean, I had built my tolerance up to a 12 to 18 pack a day, but I did it every day for like 15 years. Now, if I drink one beer today, I'm slobbing out my mouth. And the, the beer wasn't in the Bible. Well, let me give you something now. So, for me to say to you, if you drink a beer, you're sinning, is like saying to you, if you eat fried chicken, you're sinning. Because of gluttony. Just keep eating. Obesity, and I'm not talking about obesity, I'm talking about gluttony. What is gluttony? You can't stop eating stuff that you know you shouldn't eat. That's a sin too. But Paul gave us something that is so profound that for me, it would never... Want, I would never desire to drink a beer or any alcohol. Not because I think if I drink a beer, I'm going to hell. Watch this. I just read you the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Put verse 9 and 10 back up there, Uriah. Here's what Paul says. And when you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. So if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I'll never eat meat again as long as I live, for I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. Now watch this. He's talking about food, but then you, Romans connects it to the liberties of a Christian that is more seasoned to the to the, the bondages of a young believer. My wife and I have kids. I'm going to try to set this up to where you understand. I got my baby, my boys. Most of you guys are parents. So it's like this. If I stand out on Arsenal Street, rush hour, 
let's, let's not even put our children in it. Let's say we are, we've been asked to babysit a preschool class. Yeah, that works. Thank you, Lord. We've been asked to be the chaperones of a three-year-old class. And they're watching everything we do. And we're on rush hour traffic on Arsenal Street. And my class is there. And I look at them. And I run across the street and dodge cars and get to the other side. And I wait. Would you do that? Or would you run back over there and say, wait a second, don't do that. You could get hurt. You're not old enough to cross the street like I did. So if you do what I did when you cross the street, you're going to get killed. I'm going to ask you today, man, and maybe you can, I don't know, maybe you think back in your Christian life, have you ever allowed something that you could do and you flaunted it in front of a weaker believer because you could do it and then you saw them do it and it was their demise? Because if you've done that, the Bible says it's better for you to tie a rock around your neck and jump off in the lake. Watch this. When I have my kids, I wanted to protect my babies. I didn't want them sticking screwdrivers in the light socket. We'd always, if they get to the stove, I would make sure that they didn't touch the stove. My son, you know, scared to death. He wouldn't go down to the creek flood season. I did everything that I can to make sure that my kids the younger people around me would not harm themselves. We would do safety precautions, like don't stick your hand in the light socket. It will hurt you. And we were also worried about don't put small things in your mouth because you could choke. For me, choking is like a phobia. Like I just, I have nightmares about my kids choking. Like I can't handle it. I won't even let them eat an apple. Because of stinking Snow White, bro, as a kid. Like, nah, ain't happening. No, no apples. If I were to babysit your children, they wouldn't eat, for one. <laughs> Cereal. But if I was to babysit your kids, then I would do everything in my power to make sure that what I did, that I was able to do, that they wouldn't do because they would harm themselves. I would make sure that they were protected. Paul deals in the Corinthian church. He he hits the issue about food and he connects it to the weaker believer. Let me let me set the context of this scripture. In Corinthian, they had so many temples in the city, and they had sex temples. They had all kinds of just ungodly satanic rituals, and they always sacrificed meat. So if you got a slab of ribs in the, in the Corinthian city, which at that time was probably a quarter million people, you ate meat that they had sacrificed to one of their demon gods. Now here's what Paul, listen to this, Paul is ruthless. I love Paul, man. He's, he's a gangster for Jesus. I mean, they're sacrificing all this meat to these demon gods. Paul, Paul walks up in the square and grabs a slab of ribs and starts eating it. And all the weak Christians went, you're, you're eating meat sacrificed to idols? Yeah, it's pretty good. That, gods ain't real. I'm covered in the blood. They can't hurt me. But if Paul would have kept eating the meat, these young Christians had just been delivered out of that ungodly idolatry, demonic worship. And they would have said, well, if Paul can eat it, then let me get in it. And then they would have grabbed a slab of ribs and they weren't strong enough to to be sucked back in to what they were delivered out of. And Paul understood, well, if you grab ribs, you're not as spiritually mature as me, so then you're going to eat the ribs just because I did it. You said, if you can do it, I can do it. So now you're going to eat the ribs. You're going to hang out the temple a little longer. And little by little, you'll make your way right back into the very thing that God called you out of. Paul said, listen, if I do that, woe is 
me. Just because I can eat a slab of ribs, that's sacrifice to a demon, because I know where I'm at in my faith, and I know that I'm delivered, and I know that if I eat that meat, I know spiritually mature, I'm not going back to worship a God. Just because I can do it, and if I do it, and if I lead you astray, it doesn't give me the right to do it. So if me eating me, sacrifice to God, will cause you to stumble, then I will never eat meat again. And the church has this process where, well, if you're in leadership, you can't drink. No, we're going to throw that out at Mercy Point because if you're a Christian, you should be concerned who's watching you have freedom that maybe they don't have. I can give you statistics of how dangerous alcohol is. More people die in drunk driving. I mean, there's so many alcoholics in the world. I mean, I can give you all the negatives about drinking alcohol. Just because you can drink a beer and be good doesn't mean that dude that just got saved can. And he may drink a beer because you drink a beer and he may drink two and it may turn to three and it may turn to four. Next thing you know, he's a raging alcoholic, beating his wife, hanging out in the bars, missing church, get hit, somebody dies and goes to hell. And it started because you being more mature in the faith allowed your freedom to be a God and led him astray. So is that godly? Then if you want to drink, go in the closet and drink. Sit at your home. But then you got to watch your kids. And your wife, can she just drink one beer? Or if your kids connect you drinking a beer to the church and they're raised up and they say, well, I can drink because my daddy was a leader in the church and I would watch him drink a beer every night. And then Johnny so-and-so starts drinking. And then what happens? Who do you think God's going to hold accountable for that? You may forget about it, but he don't. And Paul said, if I can drink a beer, well, no, he didn't say that, but if I can eat a slab of meat and I know it, I'm good, it doesn't mean you can. So it's a matter of love for the believer. Are we more concerned about the younger Christian's well-being? Paul says, if you have Christian liberties and you sit at a table and you're around other Christians and you drink your beer, like, good. He said, that wisdom's puffed up. That doesn't build up. Love builds up. In other words, if you're sitting at a table and you know you can do one, but you don't know about everybody else, it's best not to take care of it. It's best just to keep it real and don't lead them astray. This is for Christians. Think about it. I can't drink a beer. I'm good. There's some of them that just give me a beer, you you get problems. I'm not even going there. And I thank God protect me in that. Because that's too close to sin. Even if you drink a beer, it's not sin. Why would you want to get so close to it? If you got the Spirit of God in you, why do I want to get so close to that mess? Why? Because you can? Well, then that's pride. And that's pride. And pride becometh before the fall. So for me to preach to my church and say, listen, if you drink a beer, it's sin. No, it is not sin. But I can tell you this. If you drink beer and other people hear about you drink beer and they follow you down that path and then they relapse and all of a sudden they're busting hell wide open, you just sinned. Because you took freedom and you and you showed them you could do it. So if I can do it and I can get this close to it, then you can. No, that is not how it works. And what those missionaries did that day, and they were talked to, 
because they didn't know the American culture was I was fresh in recovery. And they repented and they never drank again. It caused me to stumble because for a moment I said, well, man, what am I depriving myself from alcohol for? What? Dude, this is where it's at, bro. Heck yeah. What am I doing? I'm roof all day, four o'clock. I can't even tell them I don't drink. Are you crazy? Give me one. Man, so good. You see, it's the Spirit of God in you that will cause you to say, what am I demonstrating to my family, to the weaker Christian. So Paul understood it this way. There are levels of faith. Some people can never, ever drink. You and me, never, ever. If we do, call the task force. Because we're bad off. But if you can, cool. For example, if I I get on a a 20-foot high high rope and I can come off of it and I can climb across it and my my little boy sees me and I get on the other side and I'm like, well, if you can do it, do it. 20 feet down. You would never do something like that. That's what we do when we exploit our liberties in God. Intoxication. And because of that, that is enough for me to not want nothing to do with it. If I have to be that careful around something, or else I could cause someone else to sin, or else I could, man, who knows? That may be the bear that sent me over the edge. Why would I want to mess with it? Why well, do I don't want my children to? To see, because I know I had him tell me, listen, man, I've been through this thing 12 years now, battling with alcohol. Oh, no, 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 no. I've got out drinking my own home then. Okay, that's cool. But what about your kids? They see you come to church with your hands raised and they see you drinking a beer. What if they grow up and they say, you know what, my dad drank beer and served God so I can drink beer? And maybe they can't just have one. It's the stumbling block that Paul says don't do that because if you cause us to stumble and cause believers to stumble Jesus says this if you cause one of my little ones to stumble he's not talking about little kids study it out he's talking about young Christians If you cause one of my little ones to stumble, it's better that you take a huge millstone, wrap it around your neck, go out to the middle of Lake Galilee and jump off in it. Because you will answer. We will be held accountable for every word and everything we say, including me. And that's not just with alcohol. That's with everything we do. That's what you listen to. You know, let's get on it, man. We're gonna talk about. Let's talk about everything. Let's talk about the music we listen to in the car, man. Listen, I love rap. As a matter of fact, gangster rap. Like the more gorier, the better. It's horrible. It's sick. Like give me stuff with a lot of cussing and oh, that's what I. That's sickening. So if I'm listening to it. And a weaker Christian hears me listening to it and he gets in there and all of a sudden that stuff triggers his old life and he reverts back to where he came from. Guess what? I just caused him to stumble. So here's the piece that you got to think about. Do I love the weaker Christian? Not weaker. I shouldn't say weaker. Younger. Enough.
not even talk about. Yeah, I'll drink one. Don't even talk about it. If you can't do it, don't talk about it. Don't tell me to do it. Why? Because then it drops a seam. Yeah. And they think they can do it. And all of a sudden, they're head jammed up. Yeah. And they can't come back. And then we're like, oh, look at that kid. Look at him. How did he? Why did he? And I don't want to get to heaven. And God said, remember so and so? Remember how you used to listen to gangster rap and drink a beer? You could do it. But like 55 other people that saw you do it couldn't do it. And then their kids couldn't do it. And then their kids couldn't do it. And then their kids couldn't do it. You're held accountable for every one of them. Boom, to be the seat of Christ. I don't want to live like that. I've caused enough people to stumble as a Christian. Trust me. Trust me, man. I'm preaching to myself. I may not drink alcohol in 12 years, but I tell you what, my actions, my anger, my... Fl- oh, I've caused a ton of people to stumble, man. And I'm at a phase in my life where I'm sick and tired of doing that. Something's happening on the inside of me. The Spirit of God is beginning to develop something in me to where there's such a conviction. I don't want to get around anything that is remotely dangerous to God or anything that could be remotely ungodly. If you can drink one, that's cool. But the buzz is the sin and who watches you and you're stolen. That if you can play on that kind of a tightrope, then you do it. But I don't want to do it. Ghetto Kool-Aid, like a bag of sugar, just a little bit of, y'all know what that is, man, just ghetto Kool-Aid, just so thick you can't even see through it, man. Yeah. Worship team. Please stand. So, in our movement, in the Assemblies of God, Because of that piece right there, zero tolerance. The Assemblies of God says, no ordained minister, certified... No, 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 we're not even going... You can't drink. Because of the dangers of who follows. Can't drink. Because of who follows. We're supposed to build up, not tear down. And if we truly love the body of Christ, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't show everybody what we can do. Come on, Mara, let's pray. I want to pray for Mara. Anybody else battling with, with sickness today? We're going to give an altar call, but I want to pray for her specifically. My cousin Anthony is not here. I wish he was. Grandma, won't you come and stand in for him? Cancer subject to the blood of Jesus. Cancer is subject to the blood of Jesus. Anoint her. Father, I pray, God, that you touch Anthony and Laura. This cancer has to flee. God, by your stripes, we are God, you were bruised for our iniquity. You were, you were lashed.
gashed and you were cut so that we can be healed, God, and we believe in your healing, working power. And I pray right now for Mara Dingman that this cancer would go in Jesus' name. I pray right now for Anthony that this cancer would go in Jesus' name. Cancer is subject to the blood of Jesus Christ. Heal them, Lord. Heal them, Lord. Heal them, Lord. Ella, we pray for Ella right now, God, that you touch that little girl, God, that long life would clothe her, God, that with long life you are satisfied in God in Jesus' name. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Give an altar call. Not so, I'm not drinking, I'm not, not that, be cool. But that we would love our brother. That we would do to others what we would want them to do to us. We would prefer and we would be mindful of someone else's faith. So God spoke to you this morning. I'm going to ask that you line up at these altars. And what we're going to do is Sammy's going to sing and we're just going to pray. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ before and you want to, come down to the altar. So let us lead you in prayer. We give the altar call. Come on down.